Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for the Water Reuse webinar today. I am Cassidy Campbell and I'm with the North Central Texas Council of Governments and I will be moderating today's webinar. We will have two presentations today with time for questions at the end. Please feel free to submit any questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen during the webinar. We will be recording this webinar which will be available on our website along with this presentation. Our website can be found on the last slide at the bottom. Please welcome our first speaker, Glenn Klingenpeel. Mr. Klingenpeel is the Executive Manager of Planning and Environmental Services for the Trinity River Authority of Texas. Mr. Klingenpeel received Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science degrees in Biology from the University of Texas, a Master's in Environmental Sciences from the University of North Texas, and a Master of Business Administration from the University of Texas at Arlington. He joined the Trinity River Authority in April of 1998 and has served in a number of capacities since that time. He regularly presents papers on water quality and quantity issues and serves on several local, state, and federal committees. Mr. Kling and Peel is active in the Water Environment Association of Texas, where he most recently served as chair of the Water Reuse Committee. Lynn, I will turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Cassidy. Pleasure to be here, I suppose, with you guys today. And we're going to be talking about reuse uh, and water supply with a, kind of a special emphasis on environmental flows in specific to the region in the Trinity River Basin. I'll break that down a little bit further for you. We'll start off by talking a little bit about uh, the, the basin in general and the hydrology that we have in the Trinity River Basin, uh, look at the regional water supply picture. I'll go very briefly into the history of reuse in the region to give us a historical perspective on reuse, and uh, I think you'll, you'll find that it's, it's not the new idea, I think, that many of us believe that it is. Um, and we'll talk about the different types of potable reuse. I'm not going to break that down too much in the presentation. I think we all uh, pretty much know what uh, direct versus indirect and non-potable versus potable reuse entails, so I'll, I'll make that assumption right off the bat. We'll do that, we'll have that conversation in the context of water supply and specifically to uh, the Region C, which is the region that, that we're in for water planning, uh, and, and how reuse has become such an important component of water supply in this region. And then I will talk about concerns over impacts to in-stream flows, and that's where I'm going to hand it off to Webster Mangum, uh, who's going to talk about uh, Trinity River Flows, a historical perspective, uh, and then move into some of the work that we've been doing in the river as regards to Senate Bills 2 and Senate Bill 3, and I'll let uh, Webster Mangum elaborate on that, and we'll conclude by talking about some, some next steps. So without further ado, uh, we'll begin talking about reuse and water supply in the Trinity River Basin. So here is the Trinity River Basin, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it's about 18,000 square miles, so it's a very large basin. And what you'll probably notice right off the bat is we've got two very large metropolitan areas, uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area actually situated in the upper portion of the basin and the city of Houston just to the west of the Trinity Basin. Both of those metropolitan areas rely upon water from the Trinity uh, as a major source uh, of surface water. And you've got a population now of 7 million people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and growing day by day. City of Houston, uh, same situation, population of 6.5 million. So this makes the, the Dallas-Fort Worth statistical metropolitan area the fourth largest metropolitan area in the third most populous country in the world. So let that sink in for just a minute. That's an awful lot of people and a lot of, of pressure uh, on the water supplies that we have in the basin. So if you take Dallas Worth uh, and the city of Houston, that's about half the population of the state of Texas that relies upon the Trinity for water supply. A lot of that water supply, uh, most of it in this region, comes from surface water. Uh, and since 1911, we've built more than 32 water supply reservoirs uh, to capture water when we have it and then use it during those hot, dry summers when we need it. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, hopefully, these next couple of graphs will illustrate why that works so well for us. What we're looking at here is the monthly precipitation totals from 1981 to 2010, and this is by month, January through December, uh, and this is for the North Texas region. And hopefully what you can see there is that there's a strong seasonality, and I'm sure this is no surprise to anybody, strong seasonality in those rainflow patterns. So we get most of our precipitation in the spring, uh, and then also again in the fall, uh, and it may come as a surprise to some people that October is actually the second wettest month for us, uh, right behind May, and it's because of these strong frontal systems that we have that uh, could come through. 
Uh, and that's where most of our precipitation comes from, is from uh, frontal systems and convection systems. So it, when it rains, it rains a lot. And if you look at the precipitation in London, England, uh, it's about the same as the Dallas-Fort Worth area. In fact, I think we get actually a little bit more precipitation. Uh, and I think that's, that's very counterintuitive to a lot of people because they assume London is this perpetually rainy place. And it does rain a lot, but it rains just a little bit. Here, when it rains, it rains a lot, and it rains all at once. And so it makes sense to build surface water reservoirs to capture that water supply and then use it as we go into those hot, dry summers, which is what I'm showing here. This is actually the net precipitation. So when you take out, so you add precipitation and take out the evaporation loss, uh, and you can see that that graph flips and you can see just how dry it is in June, July, August, and September. And here we've got those together. Um, and if we look at that, if we just draw some lines on there, you can see, uh, I think that seasonality perhaps a little bit better. So reservoirs have worked you know, very well in the region and for the region. And, and heretofore, that's really been the, the panacea. That has been what we have turned to when we needed additional water supplies. Problem is, uh, you can only build so many reservoirs, number one. Uh, most of or all of the, the really good high quality locations, uh, because it does take a specific geology and hydrology to build a reservoir to have one that functions, those have been used up um, when we've used them. There are a number of different reservoirs in the Region C water plan going forward. Um, but what we're having to do is move further and further east. And if you look at a rainfall gradient of the Tree River Basin, uh, it's a very strong gradient that runs from the southwest to, or excuse me, from the northwest to the southeast. We get, uh, gosh, about 30 inches of rainfall in the northwest and then over 50 inches uh, in the southeast. So very strong gradient moving from west to east. Again, no surprise there. Uh, west Texas is much drier than East Texas. So consequently, a lot of the new water supply reservoirs are being built in East Texas. But what that means is not only do you have to build a new reservoir, which is very, very expensive to do, um, it, it costs literally billions of dollars and can take decades to build to permit. The construction isn't that long, but the permitting process has become very, very arduous. Once that's done, then you have to build the pipelines, the pertinence, get the right-of-way, uh, and put all of these capital improvements into place. And then you have to continually pump that water, which is not cheap to the metropolitan areas where it's needed. One of the great things about reuse is that it happens where you need it. And so here's a, an aerial image of the city of Dallas. And I'm going to circle down here at the bottom of the screen, uh, Dallas's central wastewater treatment plant. And so if we look at reuse as a, a new supply, quote unquote, of water, you can see how close that happens to the metropolitan area where that water is needed. So, for the most part, you don't have to build those large uh, pipelines and appurtenances to move that water all the way from East Texas. Though certainly, if you look at the reuse schemes that are in the regional water plan, um, you do need some infrastructure uh, to move it to the water supply reservoirs so that you can augment those supplies. And as I mentioned at the beginning, reuse in Texas is, is really not a, a novel concept. This has been going on for hundreds of years. And, and if you move outside of Texas, it's, it's really been going on um, in what I call a de facto fashion uh, since the dawn of time. Um, but if we just look at Texas, back in the 1800s, you know, reuse was occurring in the San Antonio region through the irrigation canals that were accepting uh, return flows. And a lot of it was probably untreated or undertreated effluent, but it did serve to augment the water that was available in those canals for irrigation. The first actual legal entitlement to reuse dates back to 1901, so the turn of the, the prior, uh, prior century. And that was the San Antonio Irrigation Company, and that gave them rights to sewage both uh, present and future. And if you look at uh, some of the planning that was done in the permitting of Lake Livingston, which is at the bottom of the Trinity River Basin and catches all the return flows in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the Dallas-Fort Worth area recognized the importance of uh, return flows and Lake Livingston was made deliberately subordinate to those return flows. So I think quite visionary that the, the planners at the time recognized that, and this was back in the 1950s, that the Dallas-Fort Worth area would someday be able to, to benefit from all the return flows that were being generated up here. And this is, next, this is recognized in the, the 1968 water plan. And 1961 was the first state water plan followed on the heels of the drought of record in the 1950s. So second water plan, and it says, uh, and I quote, an essential and valuable water resource that should be managed and administered conjunctively with other water resources. So uh, again, a recognition of the important of reuse and return flows 
even if the technology and the demand hadn't quite made it uh, the most favorable option for water supply. Of course, we still were building reservoirs uh, and benefiting from those supplies. And back in 1986 or 87, TRA began discharging return flows, Tree River Authority, from our central plant into the amenity lakes in Las Colinas. In 1997, we actually obtained a, a specific water quality permit from TCEQ to discharge those return flows. So if you've been up to Las Colinas uh, and you've enjoyed those reservoirs, a lot of that water is coming from TRA's uh, Central Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant. And that, that brings up another point, and that's a distinction between indirect and, and uh, uh, non, non-potable and potable reuse. When we're talking about non-potable, typically you're going to get a water quality permit from the TCQ. And that's a specific permit that speaks to uh, the type of use, type 1 or type 2, how likely it is that people will come into contact uh, with the, 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 uh, the reused water. But if you were talking about water supply, and this is indirect, then that falls under just the, the general umbrella of water rights in the state of Texas. So ironically, there's no specific water quality uh, requirements if you're going to indirectly reuse it for potable supplies, but if you're going to indirectly reuse it or even directly reuse it for non-potable, then you get into a water quality permit. So a very important distinction there. Um, non-potable falls under the water quality permit, Section 210, and uh, potable water supply falls under water rights permitting, and both of those handled by TCEQ. I talked uh, earlier about the 1968 water plan. If we jump forward to the 2016 Regency plan, this was actually done in December 2015, but it's the 2016 plan. Now we're looking at um, 283, almost 284,000 acre feet per year of reused water that's available in 2020, just three short years from now. So, you know, several hundred thousand, thousand gallons of water that that plan says are available for potable reuse in Region C. And, you know, as, as we grow uh, in this region, looking at going from almost 7 million in 2014, excuse me, a little more than 7 million, to doubling that figure over the next 50 years and looking at something like 14.3 million by 2070. So yeah, will we actually get to that figure? You know, who knows? Time, time will ultimately tell. The best guidance that we have is the historical trends. You know, predicting what the population is going to do in the future is a lot like driving a car by looking in the rearview mirror, but that's, that's really the best data we have. So we look at the trends of the past and we try to project those into the future and see what that population is going to look like. And what it's looking like um, is that we're going to more than double our population, and that, of course, is going to put a tremendous additional demand on water supplies in this region. If you just look at the numbers, current supply in the 2016 plan so shows about uh, 1.6 million acre feet per year available to the region. Um, the projected demand, however, when you're looking at 2070, growing to almost 3 million acre feet per year, so a deficit of about 1.3 million acre feet every single year. That's a, about 4.3 billion gallons per year. We've got to find that water someplace. So that's what the water plan does. It identifies um, the supplies, the demand, identifies those shortages, and it identifies water supply strategies to overcome those shortages. And that's what we're looking at here are these different categories of supply strategies that are going to help us meet that deficit as we move towards the year 2070. And of course, that water plan is a growing document, so every five years it will be updated. And that's one of the, the I think, the things that works the best about that water plan is it's not a static document. Um, it recognizes the change. If we're not hitting those population growth targets, it recognizes that. Um, if conservation is starting to kick in, and we are certainly seeing that in this region, it can recognize that too. So then you can adjust the, those projections, uh, that deficit, and you can adjust your water supply strategies as you move forward. But we need to start planning now because, like I said earlier, if we're looking at reservoirs or other large infrastructure projects, those can take decades, literally decades, to build. And so you have to start planning for that now. And if it makes sense, then it gets built and then it serves the needs uh, of future Texans. Well, what I want you to see here in this graph is the fact that uh, new reservoirs, which I think a lot of people um, believe is going to, to be uh, the largest source of water coming into the future, it's only 19% of future water supply strategies, 19%, so less than 20%. Current supplies, those are existing supplies, 37%, uh, we just aren't fully utilizing. 
Current supplies that need to be connected, like Lake Palestine, 16%, but conservation and reuse, the new chunk of new supplies, 27% coming from conservation and reuse. So obviously a very, very important component of our future water supply strategies. Now the next couple of slides fall under a category, if, if you'll entertain me, of just kind of miscellaneous points uh, to keep in mind about indirect reuse. The first is that I touched on earlier, this is a water rights application. Uh, this is for, for potable indirect reuse. And what will happen is when you go to the TCEQ and you file an application uh, for a water right, even if it's uh, for reuse, they'll run what's called the WAM model, the Water Availability Model, and they'll run what's called Run 3. So they have different types of models, different runs. And Run 3 is a very, very conservative look at the amount of water that's available in the system. It's going to assume that there are no return flows going into the system and that everybody is fully utilizing their water rights. And it's going to look at the, the historic hydrology from about 1940 uh, all the way up through about 1990 and it's going to say, okay, now what happens if we look at that hydrology, we look at the existing water rights holders, and now we're going to put a new demand um, on that run. Let's see how often that water would be available to the person supplying for this water. So run three, obviously, very, very conservative. And because there aren't any return flows in run three, they'll actually have to add those to the model uh, to show if it's available. And so all of this is kind of, I hope, setting the stage for this bigger topic that we're going to have about reuse and how reuse affects in-stream flow. So kind of keep that in mind as, as we go through these slides. And that's why I tell you this, uh, that run three model doesn't even include return flows. So when we're talking about permitting additional return flows, you actually have to add those to the model so that they'll show up. And reuse is, of course, uh, subject to 100% direct reuse prior to discharge. Uh, that's the, the way that water rights work in Texas. When you get a, a right, you have the right to consumptively use that to exhaustion. There's no requirement, for the most part, unless it's a special condition, and those are very rare. Uh, you have the right to consumptively use that to exhaustion. There's no requirement to discharge that back into the river. Once you do, then it is subject to appropriation. It's considered abandoned, uh, and somebody can come in and file for a, a water rights application. I won't get too far down into the weeds, but the, there's been some recent movement um, regarding the Brazos River Authority's systems operation permit that kind of clarified who can and who can't uh, file an application for, uh, for uh, return flows. Um, and then under a reuse permit, and this is a key point, you're only allowed to withdraw, to divert, what you first put in. So if the TCQ issues you a water right for return flows, you'll have to produce what's called an accounting plan, and you're, you're accounting for the water. Um, and it's just like taking money out of your bank account. Before you can take it out, you've got to put it in. So again, uh, under this larger, uh, this larger conversation about how return flows and reuse affects in-stream water, you can only take out what you've already put in. Um, indirect reuse is limited in, in, in practice to the number of times that, that it can be used. So you can't get into this iterative process where even though you may have the right to consumptively reuse it from a practical perspective, you really can't. If you were to try to reuse that water ad infinitum, so let's say you discharge 100 million gallons per day and you put it into a reservoir, and you pull, you pull that right back out and you use it, and then you put the remainder back in. because Use up here in Region C, and I want to say up here, I mean the Dallas-Fort Worth area, is municipal. Um, it's, it's not a, an entirely consumptive use. Some of the water that we use goes to lawns, but a lot of it goes towards taking showers, taking baths, and yes, flushing toilets or washing vegetables. And all of that water goes right back through the wastewater treatment plant and is then discharged back into the system. So we're not talking about complete consumption. But if you did try to do that in a reservoir, after several iterations, you're going to start running into water quality problems because you're putting more and more concentrated return flows into that water body. And from a practical standpoint, there'll be a limit as to how much of that that you can really do. So again, uh, you're limited into how much of that you can truly consume and take out of the system. And Region C, as I mentioned earlier, um, Major future water um, demand is projected to be municipal. It is now. It's projected to be so in the future. It's not agricultural. Uh, it's not mining. It's not other things that will evaporate in the atmosphere or put it into the ground where it's lost to the system. So it's not 100% consumptive. Typically what we see in a completely sewered system, you get about 60, 65% of that water back through your system. 
Uh, in some of the other areas, growing areas like Frisco and McKinney, uh, up in the north uh, eastern part of the Trinity River Basin, still have a lot of septic tanks, and that is consumptive, so the return flow factor there, as we call it, is a lot lower. It's probably about 40 percent. But um, a lot of that is still coming, coming back through the system. All right, I want to turn now and start talking about direct potable reuse. And I put this little graphic together uh, to make a point, but I think we all understand that it is not, as a lot of people think, a, a pipe that takes water from the toilet uh, and takes it to a faucet. There is a whole lot that happens between those two points. But direct potable reuse is, in essence, taking it from a wastewater treatment plant to a water treatment plant. Of course, there is um, advanced filtration that happens, reverse osmosis. Uh, the requirements to do that are, are, are very significant in terms of uh, virus reductions and pathogen reductions. So basically what you end up with is, is pure water. So I want to talk about that a little bit because it's um, gained a lot of attention in Texas. And that I think there was a thought that this was going to start popping up everywhere. We're going to start seeing direct potable reuse across the state. Uh, and that, that's just not going to happen. This was a graphic I pulled from a publication that uh, we produced through the, the Wheat Reuse Committee. And what it's showing here basically is when you move along a scale from non-potable reuse to direct potable reuse, you can think of that kind of as a continuum, the amount of acceptance that you need from your service area, um, from the people who are going to be consuming this water or using this water, it grows exponentially as you move along that line. So when, you, when you're down at the bottom end and you're talking about non-potable reuse or NPR, you really don't need a whole lot of, of buy-in from the public because I think everybody understands you're watering, um, you know, a median or you're flushing toilets at a, um, at, at a, at a sports venue, at a stadium. Uh, there's not really an opportunity to interact there with the, with the reuse. I think that's generally very, very well accepted. You move up then to de facto potable reuse or DFPR, and what that means is it, it's happening de facto. You're not planning for it. You just happen to be downstream from somebody's discharge, but you, you're able to take advantage of that because you actually have more water in the system that's coming by um, or into your reservoir or by your diversion point. Passive potable reuse is like de facto. You're not really changing anything, but one day you realize, hey, we've got a lot of extra water. We can account for it. We can actually take credit for that, and that's uh, passive potable reuse where you're actually accounting for the additional water. Engineered potable reuse is where you start actively trying to manage that reuse. And so maybe you're uh, moving your diversion point or you're pumping water that's been discharged, turn flows have been discharged, into a water supply reservoir or moving it to a diversion point. So you've actually engineered something to allow you to take advantage of those return flows. And then, of course, at the opposite end of that spectrum from non-potable is direct potable reuse or DPR. Potable reuse really became um, or came out of necessity when we went into the drought of 2010 to 2014, and Wichita Falls was really forced into that situation. Uh, they benefited from, they had a desal plant that they had, and they were actually able to, to retrofit that pretty easily. Uh, of course, Big Springs has a, a currently operating uh, direct potable reuse plant. Wichita Falls has converted back to indirect potable reuse, which was their plan all along. So currently there is one operating direct potable reuse facility in the state of Texas. Uh, El Paso's got one in the works as well. Um, and I know that another, a, a number of other uh, municipalities are looking at the feasibility of it as well. And really, the, the Big Spring um, initiative started be before the drought of 2010 to 2014 because of this extended drought that we've had in West Texas. But this is really what, uh, what triggered this conversation. Um, and one of the interesting things that we found in our study was that when you're looking at direct potable reuse, you can really think of it as a substitute. So um, in, in, economic, in economics, you, you call this the cross-elasticity curves, and that's what you're looking at here. So if, if you're a, a Coke drinker, um, but the price of Coke goes up, at some point you're going to think, you know what, I'm going to give Pepsi a try, and I'll switch over to Pepsi. And you can really think about direct potable reuse in those terms. It is a substitute for conventional water supplies. But what we found was the acceptance of direct potable reuse as a substitute for conventional water supplies really depended upon the community that you found yourself in. When you look at Big Spring, there were some water quality issues with the water that they were using. Groundwater had a high sulfur content, so it wasn't very high quality water. And so using direct potable as a substitute, which is actually very high quality, it's basically pure water, uh, not exactly, but pretty, pretty close, 
um, that's an easy sell because you started off with a, a poor quality uh, substitute to begin with, original to begin with. If you go to other communities where uh, you know, maybe they're a little bit more progressive and they're willing to embrace this idea of direct potable reuse, that curve can look very, very different. So you don't have to move very far along that cost curve or practicality curve for conventional supplies before direct potable reuse starts to look like an attractive uh, substitute. You can even get into a situation where cities uh, are so concerned about the environment that discharging return flows, which, which can be seen, and I think incorrectly, but can be seen as being detrimental to the environment, and certainly can in some certain circumstances, where that is something that, that uh, the community wants to avoid. And so you could actually see, and I, what you're seeing here is we've actually flipped direct potable reuse and engineered potable reuse, where direct potable reuse might actually be more desirable sooner than an engineered potable reuse because it avoids having to discharge return flows into the environment. So uh, again, the drivers that would lead you to direct potable reuse really depend upon the community in which you find yourself. But at the end of the day, uh, direct potable reuse only makes sense really in a, in a limited number of cases. You need kind of a magic formula before that really does start to make sense. And first and foremost is, an absence of conventional supplies, because after all, direct potable reuse, as I said, can be seen as a substitute for conventional supplies. Um, and it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense in North Texas. It might. On, in some situations, I can think of one uh, small community that's looking at it just because of the juxtaposition of the wastewater treatment plant to the, the potable plant. But, you know, we've got a lot of reservoirs in this area, and, and so it's very easy to to engineer those return flows so that they can discharge into an existing water supply reservoir so you can avoid that direct potable. Um, the cost uh, of direct potable is, is very significant. If you look at the, the plant, uh, the energy, the capital that has to go into, uh, into direct potable reuse, it's very, very expensive. It is, it is not cheap. Indirect potable is much cheaper. Though I, it could be used as an emergency supply, and I certainly see some opportunities for that. But again, maintaining the infrastructure, you know, the, the membranes that you have to push that, uh, those return flows through, are, they need to be used. Um, they, need to be ex they have a shelf, shelf life. They need to be exercised. And so there's a cost that goes along with that as well. Um, and revamping those, those facilities can be very, very expensive too. So looking at the future of potable reuse, uh, if we're looking just at Region C, which is the pie chart you see in 2020, uh, of, this is potable reuse in general, not just direct potable anymore. Now we're looking at the, the whole gamut. About 284,000 acre feet, as I mentioned earlier in 2020, growing to 2060 to almost 409,000 acre feet per year. It's available statewide. Direct potable projected to increase from 33,000 acre feet in 2020 to almost 90,000 acre feet per year by the year 2070. And that begs the question if we're going to be directly reusing return flows, that is a consumptive use. You know, we talked earlier about how indirect potable reuse uh, is, is a non-consumptive, for the most part, use of water. A lot of that comes right back through the system. When we start talking about potable, direct potable reuse, you're taking that whole stream uh, and you're putting it back in, into service. So none of that gets discharged. So there's no environmental benefit to having those flows in the river. And that's where I want to kind of shift the conversation now and hand it over to Webster Mangum, who's going to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Glenn. We appreciate your presentation. Uh, please welcome our second speaker, Webster Mangum. Mr. Mangum is the Environmental Services Manager for the Trinity River Authority of Texas. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Communications from the University of Central Oklahoma and a Master of Science degree in Applied Geography and Water Resources Management from the University of North Texas. Mr. Mangum has worked for the Trinity River Authority for 12 years and specializes in water quality, biological watershed, and environmental flow studies throughout the 18,000 square mile Trinity Basin. He serves on the Senate Bill 3 Environmental Flows Expert Science Team and is a recognized authority on in-stream flows. All right, Bob, I will hand it over to you. Wow, thanks for all the applause. I appreciate the nice, the nice warm welcome. So, Reuse does not happen in a vacuum. I'm going to talk a little bit about how various components of the water supply affect this concept of reuse and water supplies. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, historical overview of flows in the Trinity River, um, some of the environmental, legislation, environmental flow legislation, as well as some of the studies that TRA and other state agencies are working on, and then where we're going in the future, some next steps. 
The Trinity is and always has been a very flashy system. In the 1800s, expeditions were planned around when the Trinity River was expected to be up or down. Sometimes of the year, people could step over the river, walk horses over it, uh, dogs wouldn't even have to swim across it. And days later, it could be over a mile, sometimes two miles wide in some places in the middle Trinity. This picture is from the 1899 survey of the Trinity River. It was a Corps of Engineers survey, one of three that happened in the late 1800s. And you can see here that the surveyors are just walking across the river. You can also see how quiet the water is. There's not a lot of velocity moving through there. And that just talks about how low these uh, base flows used to be in the, in the 1800s and going into the, uh, into the historical record in the past. So this is a really interesting graph. This chart shows the population of the Dallas-Fort Worth area by decade. So you can see back in 1900, less than a million people. And this goes up through 2000 where you're at five, five million people. And I think now we're up to about six and a half, seven million people in the DFW area. What's interesting about this is if you look at the population growth and then you look at the annual seven day low flow for the Dallas gauge, which is, uh, I think it's on Cedar Crest in, in downtown Dallas. So if you take every seven day period for each year and you pick that lowest flow, average it together, and you see how the low flow has gone from well less than probably 30 CFS in the 1900s, and now that gauge is probably running about 400 CFS. And in some, in, in some, in some ways it would seem that as population increases, more water is, is consumed, so those flows would go down, but that's not the case in the DFW area. So shown another way, if you look at the red box here is the, the year 1956, which is the drought of record, the worst year, the lowest flow year of uh, the drought of record in, in the 1950s. 2011 was actually a drier year than 1956. And if you look at the mean annual discharge at the roster gauge, which is just downstream of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, it takes into, it's basically what we use as a surrogate for what's coming out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And you can see that those flows are quite a bit higher between 1956 and 2011. Although you have a huge population increase, you're not getting that consumptive use of water. Same things happen, same, same phenomenon happens here at the annual discharge at the Oakwood gauge, which is about middle, uh, the mid-basin. And the same thing again down at Romare, which is about river mile 50 or so upstream from the mouth of the Trinity River, below Lake Livingston, but above Trinity Bay. So if you look at the top graph here, you're seeing the mean annual discharge from Oakwood in 1956 is the red line. The blue line is the mean annual discharge from 2011. And if you focus here kind of on the summer months, you see that in 1956, that gauge at Oakwood in the middle basin was running about 100 CFS. Now, just those same flow, very dry, very low precipitation times have about a 600, about a five or 600 CFS flow at that gauge. If you go downstream to Romare, the same phenomenon happens, but it's for a different reason. This isn't reuse driven because this is below Lake Livingston. So again, um, 50 miles upstream of the bay, you still have about 100 CFS in 1956. And here we have about 1,100 CFS, and this is releases from Lake Livingston going downstream to the city of Houston through the Seawood Canal. Again, elevated base flows throughout the entire Trinity, but above Lake Livingston is for the reuse. It's, it's because of reuse. Below Lake Livingston, those low flows are because of releases. So drought has a big impact as well on water supplies in the Trinity Basin. That's no surprise. So if you look at this graph here, which is the, from the U.S. or the Texas Drought Monitor, and you look at the variability of precipitation in this basin is tremendous. <clears throat> Texas experienced significant drought conditions for four years from 2011 to 2015. So all of this spot in here, you've got basically any, basically average of 90% of the state in severe to moderate uh, drought conditions. But if you look at this, just a few months later, we're down to 5% of the base or 5% of the state in, in uh, drought conditions. That's quite, that just goes to show the dynamics of this system, that even though you're in a massive drought here, very quickly, the entire state can be out of a drought situation. This is a very interesting 
graph here as well. If you look at 2015, 2015 was a very dynamic year. So 2015, you had about 70% of the base of the state. Keep saying basin, but this is the state. 70% of the state in uh, drought conditions. Very quickly, it went down to zero by July. By September, 70% of the state is in drought conditions again. And by December, zero is in drought conditions. This is, the term for this was a flash drought. It was very significant. Now this drought did not, if you look at the flow records, it does not show this drought into it because all the reservoirs were full. So we went, we got a lot of the, a lot of the state went back into drought conditions while these rivers were full to the top of the levee as the Corps of Engineers was, or, and all the water, or uh, the lake owners were releasing that water out of, the, out of the reservoir. So it's interesting how you can look at precipitation and drought and it doesn't always tie to the gauge record. So water, water availability models and percent exceedance curves at the Trinity River at Rosser. So we kind of talked about above Lake Livingston and below Lake Livingston are kind of two different, two different systems operationally and they have different drivers. So again, this is that roster gauge. It's just downstream of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It actually picks up the east fork, actually comes in upstream of this gauge. So this gauge is up representative of this entire upper basin. So we'll talk a little bit about naturalized flows, current conditions, and future conditions. So naturalized flows, what these do is they back out water supply reservoirs and return flows, kind of taking it back to what would be here if there weren't any, um, any projects in the basin to capture or return water to the system. The current conditions, that looks at a very conservative estimation of what's going on right now. Um, and by that I mean it's WAM run 8, if you know about that. What that means is when you look at current conditions, it's looking at the maximum use of water with minimum return flow. So very, very conservative. We're saying we're using all of our water rights, but we're not putting a whole lot back into the system. Future conditions is what we think is much more realistic. This is looking at the maximum use of all water supplies in the basin, plus using all of the return flows, then taking a coefficient, we use 62%, 62% of that one, one round through the return flow is released back into the system. So what's interesting, if you look at the future line, which is the purple line right here, from above the 60th percentile flows, it's higher than the current conditions and the naturalized flows. Again, more proof to that concept that more people means more return flows in the system. The Romare gauge is a little bit different of a driver, again, below Lake Livingston. Same concept here. So for the future conditions, from about the 50th percentile onwards, you have more water than the naturalized flows. So a lot of this has to do, because it's below Lake Livingston, a lot of these releases have to do with the water that's sent from Lake Livingston down through the Sewa Canal to, to uh, the city of Houston. So again, artificially elevated base flows. Galveston Bay, the water going into Galveston Bay. So the fact that future conditions show less water except under very, very low flows and less than current conditions below about 60% has nothing to do with reuse. These are very, very, these are very, very senior water rights holders and these are irrigation rights. Now, the Seawood Canal is about at River Mile 65, so it's, no, I'm sorry, River Mile 45. So it's downstream of the Romare Gauge, but obviously upstream of Trinity Bay. So these water rights, as of right now, they're used in a consumptive capacity for irrigation, but in the future, they're anticipated they will convert to municipal rights. So again, it will still be consumptive to the bay, to Trinity Bay, because the water won't make it to Trinity Bay, but it will get diverted through Siwa over to Houston and then return through the San Jacinto River into Galveston Bay. So when we're looking at the concept of water supplies, we have to look at the entire system. Uh, Glenn, who just spoke with you, came up with this concept and this diagram, um, and he terms it the water triumvirate. I can't say that word very well, but uh, it means three things, right? Like three legs of a stool. 
In order to satisfy the basin's needs, we have to look at the wastewater, water supply, and environment all together. Each part has to work with the needs of the other. You can't focus on one without causing issues with, with the other two. It's, as water supplies become more and more and more and more and more important, we have to make sure that we're using them more and more and more efficiently. And all three of these legs of this stool have to be accounted for. Again, this is a great graph. If you look at 2014, we're again talking about kind of the dynamics of this system and the, the world we live in and trying to work all these studies. To, as we try to tie all three of these concepts together, we're in a very dynamic environment. So the red block below are the cumulative, is the cumulative discharge at the Rosser gauge downstream of Dallas in 2014. Between 2014 and 2015, there's an order of magnitude difference in the amount of water that passed that gauge. That's, that's tremendous. So within the context of this system, we've got to make sure it all works together. So a little bit about environmental flows. Senate Bill 2 created the Texas Instream Flow Program, the TIFP. It's a combination of TCEQ, Texas Water Development Board, and Parks and Wildlife. And what the goal of that study is, that legislated, legislatively mandated study, is to identify flow, regi flow, regi flow, <laughs> flow regimes that support a sound ecological environment. So if you want to see a bunch of nerd scientists argue for about a week, just tell them to come up with a definition of sound ecological environment and uh, just watch the show. It's quite interesting. Senate Bill 3 in 2007 created the environmental flows process. That said, we need to use the best available science for each, each basin to establish environmental flow standards. We're also going to have adaptive management. So we're going to set these, these uh, environmental flow standards, and then every 10 years we're going to look at them and see if they still make sense. So these two very important pieces of legislation come to the Trinity Basin. So looking back to about 2010, looking at TRA's environmental flow studies, we've got 2010, we did a baseline longitudinal study. We ran about 225 miles of the river and uh, collected quite a bit of data through that. We did, again, 290 miles in 2011 and go on down. And you see that in 2012, we used the best available science through the Senate Bill 3 process to establish the flow standards for the Trinity Basin. So if you'll look down a little bit, you see in 2014, Senate Bill 2, which is designed to establish a scientifically based flow regime, that study made it to the Trinity Basin. So essentially, we decided on flow values before we ever had the studies. So right now, the Trinity, in the Trinity Basin, we're doing Senate Bill 2 work. We're almost to the adaptive management phase of Senate Bill 3, trying to reestablish and prove these, go these uh, flow standards are valid. So again, the Trinity River is very, di very, very dynamic. If you look at how we're trying to put these studies in, this is the, um, the gauge at Oakwood. You can see in 2011 and 12, we're working in very low flow conditions, and then bang, 2015 and 2016 happens. So we're trying to come up with science-based studies, and it's, sometimes it's a little hard to do when the river's uh, 60 feet deep. So these are the flow standards. So each, you know, Obviously, I know it looks like a bingo card, but work with me here a little bit. The subsistence flows at Grand Prairie are 19 CFS. What that means is in the winter, the subsistence flow is 19, the base flow is 45, and we expect a pulse of 300 CFS to come through. So what this is basically saying is we need a regime, not just a single number. We need a range of flows, a legislatively mandated range of flows for what can create a sound ecological environment. So what they did is they went to these different gauges. The Grand Prairie gauge is a measurement point. The Dallas gauge is a measurement point. The Oakwood gauge is a measurement point, And the Romero gauge is a measurement point. For example, this box, these flows have to be satisfied at the Romero gauge before any other water right can be approved. So now, once those uh, Senate Bill 3 flows were created, now we're in the process of evaluating those SB3 flow standards. The goal of the project that we're working on now is to use and assess the in-stream physical and ecological functions of the Senate Bill 3 flow standards. So a lot of these flow standards were statistically driven. Well, what do those statistically driven flow standards mean in the environment? Are they, for example, 
Are the pulse flows doing what pulses should do, making sure the ripples stay clean? Are they moving sediment around? Are they um, moving uh, seeds, say uh, riparian trees, riparian tree seeds up and down the banks and downstream in the river? Are we providing backwater habitat for fish to spawn? So what are these flows that were statistically driven? What are they actually doing? These are very big questions and very big and expensive studies that we're undertaking right now. So I showed you where the monitoring sites were for Grand Prairie, Dallas, Oakwood, and Romare. So what we did is we did that longitudinal study where essentially we ran the river from Fort Worth to the bay. We collected a lot of data along the way. We used that to divide the river up into certain segments and reaches. Then we went inside those reaches around those measurement points and we picked out certain sites. So each site's about two kilometers long or so. And so our site here is at River Mile 485 and it's representative of the Grand Prairie gauge. River Mile 444 is representative of the Dallas gauge. Um, this would be a pretty boring study since this gauge is directly in the levees. So uh, it's kind of hard to get a riparian uh, study going in that situation. So we went downstream a little bit to uh, River Mile 444. Again, the Oakwood study and the Romare study. So what are we doing in these studies? Um, just to give you a little idea of the field work that we're doing, one of the things we need to be able to do is watch how the river's changing. Are the cross sections changing? Are, is the river in dynamic equilibrium? Are we aggrading? Are we degrading? What's happening in the channel? So what we do is we take uh, scientific concrete and scientific rebar and we take it up into the riverbanks and we put in these benchmarks. We hammer those benchmarks in about two or three feet deep with post hole diggers, put an 80-pound bag of concrete and some rebar, and set that benchmark in in an area that will never be disturbed until it's disturbed. So you can see this is one of our benchmarks down here when we had about 100 feet of erosion during the flood. We also collect quite a bit of sediment data. The sediment data feeds into our models and we can see again, are we aggrading, are we degrading, are we moving the sediment through our riffles? Because the, the riffles need, you need that clean riffle habitat for uh, some of the small minnow species. We do a lot of survey grade GPS work. And I like this. I like this slide a lot because it talks about several different things. So what happens here is I've got my iPhone up and I'm sticking it through the eyepiece of a robotic total station, taking a distance shot to a prism that is right here and I'm about 700 feet away from this spot. And I was sitting here waiting to take this shot over and over and over and I kept watching Ben here try to make it up this bank, lay face first, slide all the way back down to the bottom. So I decided I want to get a few of those on video. So by the time I got my phone out and running, he didn't eat it again. But again, I like this picture a lot because it talks about the survey methods. And as I looked at this picture, I realized it's really pretty interesting the way that we tie these things together. We have survey grade sub-centimeter GPS. We have very high quality, high precision robotic total stations shooting on these prisms. We also laser scan these banks. And at the same time, we've got a survey. You can see a survey rod here and we'll take level shots and we use this uh, metal detector here to find things like erosion pins that we put into the bank or to find the benchmarks when they're very overgrown. So this, this slide does a pretty good job of showing how we aggregate all this information collected in very different methods and put it all together. Um, we do quite a bit of bathymetric surveying. Um, again, we do riparian work where we identify trees along these transects. Um, we just completed a study where we took about 40 cores to age class some of these trees, see if we can tie the age classes to different pulse events that came through the system. That works underway right now. Um, a, really, a really inexpensive but high, high return on your investment um, piece of equipment is these automated game cameras. We have them set up to take pictures about every uh, two hours and we set them up high in these trees shoot them down at the river and we can see, we can tie the flow, we know the flow from the gauge, and then we can tie that to the picture of these cross sections. When are we inundating these different types of backwater habitat? When are we getting out into the floodplain? What, again, the whole point of this, these studies are what do these flows actually mean in the environment? What are we actually doing? So here we put this way high up in a tree at 60,000 CFS 
and we said, okay, we're going to watch this river come down, and we're going to see which flows are we getting back down into the channel. At which flows, where's that kind of really intricate flow that's really important to, to flood the floodplain? So we wanted to watch the flows come down, and you can probably guess we watched them come up instead. And at 80,000 CFS at the Oakwood Gauge, we were underwater. So we also did a linear survey. Instead of looking at these two-kilometer sections, so the two-kilometer research site for this area around the Oakwood Gauge is right here where Kichai Creek comes in. So what we did is we put a boat in, we ran downstream for the entire reach, and we went through at about uh, 12,000 CFS, and we mapped all of the backwater habitat that might be available, be that perch tributaries, be that uh, other tributaries that come in, is it an on-channel backwater habitat? Really what's going on? Because each one of those types of habitat serves a different function in the environment. As an example, we zoom into this area here, and we've got our points. Uh, it looks like the fonts didn't transfer over very well, but these are cute little uh, photograph icons on my computer. On this one, it's a red angled line, so just pretend like it's a, it's a cool icon. So you can come in here, look at these icons. We can georeference pictures to these. We can see this is a perch tributary. So we see at 12,000 CFS, we're not inundating anything back here, but we can get some elevations and we can see maybe at 20,000 CFS, we begin to inundate these areas that could serve really high quality habitat for spawning. Again, here's another picture that shows a, this would be perched, this would be a backwater habitat. So at 12,000 CFS, we are getting some inundation back here. Um, again, this is just tying flow value or uh, stage elevations along our cross sections and seeing what's happened at 11,000 CFS. Is that serving a function? Does it really mean anything to have an 11,000 CFS pulse? Again, looking at riparian, we can overlay what trees we found at what elevation. So we know black willow, box elder, and green ash. We know those are riparian species. We know those need to be inundated on a regular basis to have uh, to have recruitment of new riparian trees in that area. At this spot here, um, our pulse flows are required by SB3, are 700 CFS, 1,000, and 4,000. So here's 700 CFS, here's 1,000, here's 4,000. Are we inundating any of those trees? Of all of the riparian tree species, we're touching one there. So is that pulse serving a flow, or is that pulse serving a, serving a function in the environment? We take these, a lot of these results, we put it into um, a RAS model, we look at some water surface elevations to try to get an idea of what's going on in the floodplain. So we can put in our cross sections, uh, this is a, uh, this is actually, uh, the Grand Prairie gauge is right here. So this is Beltline Road is what this bridge is represented by this LIDAR. So we, we go along our cross sections, we have our LIDAR information, we take our cross sections and we add our survey data, then we add our survey data to our cross sections and we can begin to see at different pulse flows what's inundated. So at 1200 CFS here, everything green is inundated. So you can see at 1200 CFS, we're not really getting out into these tributaries. We're not creating any backwater habitat in here. But you look at 15,700 CFS, and yeah, there's actually some connection up in these floodplains. So again, are we serving functions at what flows? Um, this is looking at some of our, so we talked a little bit about benchmarks. You can see here um, in November of 2014, before the flooding, 2015 after the flooding, flooding, and we had about 60 feet of erosion on the left bank of this river. It's right about the same time this lock just downstream of Malloy Bridge Road really had some massive erosion on the inside and the river's actually, the river's shifting far left. And within my career here at TRA, probably this lock will disappear by getting sediment, sediment deposit on top of it and the whole river will, will shift around it and go back to more of its natural slope in that area. Um, moving sediment around, we take different sediment samples and we can break that down to uh, grain size, tie that into our RAS models with velocities and see, are we moving sediment? Are we serving a function? Um, validating some of our models, it's, it's, it's always really exciting to see that the model that you built actually works. Here you can see this dot, here is our boat with the GPS point where we are at that particular moment. We've got a little island right here at 16,500 CFS, and our model pretty much shows the same thing here at 2,100 CFS, a little bit smaller island. So uh, if you're wondering if your model works and then you drive to this area and it all works, 
it, it makes engineers smile. So what have we learned? So right now, preliminar, preliminar, preliminarily, preliminarily, we've got a few conclusions that we made, and we, we have a lot of more a lot more analysis underway right now. So what we've learned right now is SB3 pulse flows are probably not inundating these backwater habitats. We're not seeing a lot of that at these pulse flows. It's very, very, very hard to tie biological responses to a single variable of flow because there's so many other variables. There's temperature, there's rainfall, there's um, the topography, there's the sediment type, there's the season. If you got the right flow in the wrong season, you're not going to have any trees. Well, is that because you didn't get the right flow or because you got the flow at the wrong time? There are a lot of variables here. We are also finding that small pulse flows don't do a whole lot, but these big pulses do a lot of work in the channel. They make massive changes. They're almost like a channel reset. The Trinity River has extensive mussel beds. Um, we did a survey and we found a lot of freshwater mussels in the Trinity, quite shocking amounts of mussels in the Trinity. The water quality overall is very good. We have a lot of mesohabitat diversity, riffles, pools, riffles, runs, pools, glides, and backwaters. Well, what we're finding with some of these artificially raised base flows, like we talked about earlier, that we're actually maybe decreasing the amount of riffle habitat because we're flooding our riffles. We're turning our riffles into runs. At very, very low flows, we have a series of all pools. They're all disconnected. At high flows, we have all runs. So there's a continuum, there's a continuum in there between all pooling habitats and all run habitats. Well, within that are your riffles, your glides, your backwaters. All these meso habitats serve different purposes in the environment. Our sites are not degrading or degrading. Our cross sections are pretty stable, except for select area, select localized areas which are blown out because of uh, some slope, some big slope changes. But in general, our river is fairly stable. Um, we did a big baseline study in 25th or in 2014. And our follow-up studies post-flooding have not shown the same species composition in our fish study. So we're finding that these rivers do take a while to come back to some level of, of normal after these massive flood events. So next steps, we're going to continue our long-term monitoring. That's going on into the future. Um, the next step with Cinebill 2 and Cinebill 3 is to aggregate this data together to uh, get a better overall picture of the biology on top of kind of the environmental um, morphological data. We're going to increase our biological sampling, and we've got addition, additional inundation modeling upcoming, and all this to get ready for 2021. So when we talk to the, the Trinity Basin and Bay, um, <laughs> yeah, the BBASC, the Basin and Bay Area Stakeholder Committee, um, we've got some really good information to tell them how to make better decisions with these flow recommendations. What is doing what in the environment? We're not just talking about statistically derived flows. And with that, I guess we have questions, and that's the end of uh, my presentation. So thanks for your time. Thank you again to Glenn and Webster and to everyone who joined us today. Uh, today's presentation uh, and the recordings will be made available on our website, and this webinar is now closed.